former FBI agent turned short-term rental operator. What in the world? Uh, this is a crazy story. You got to hear about it right here on the Fearless Investor Podcast. Hey, welcome in everyone to the Fearless Investor Podcast. This is a really cool story, not just because Jacob Hall was once a FBI agent turned short-term rental investor, but also because he was uh, one of my first students when I first started doing a little bit more mastermind and one-on-one -on -one coaching. And uh, Jacob, right from the get-go, just burned all the boats and just went all in and said, I'm doing this thing. And he has turned it into a very nice, successful business here. Just about six or seven months into doing this, he's already at seven units uh, and he's working on replacing that full-time income that he had with the FBI. And for me, uh, Jacob is a guy that you're going to hear. He's very humble. He's very, um, you know, just a matter of fact, and just, just really focuses on relationships as well. And I know a lot of you out there are wondering like, Hey, do I have what it takes? And Hey, do you know, do I need to be a really good salesperson? Do I need to have all these refined skills? And I hope that you see today that, you know, like while Jacob did have the, the FBI and the military background, which is really great for structure, um, he didn't have all of these other things that were, you know, uh, just wow factors, right? He didn't come in being the best salesperson. He just came in focusing on doing what he said he was going to do, building relationships and following through. And of course, that's led him to getting now a lot of warm leads. And so if you want to find that same roadmap that Jacob found and was able to duplicate again and again and again, and now building that six to seven figure business, all you have to do is email us. So info at fearlesskyle.com, info at fearlesskyle.com is my email address and put in the title 6FF, same thing that's on my hat here, Six Figure Formula is the name of our coaching program. And if that's something that you want to learn more about to get on the same track as Jacob, the same track as if you saw it a couple weeks ago, Kyle and Cooper, if you saw it a few months ago, Halame, who went from zero to 50 units and collecting over $800,000 on Airbnb alone in just five months. If you want to get on the same track as these guys, um, and as many other students have been able to do, then again, info at fearlesskyle.com and in the title 6FF. But with that being said, let's get to Jacob Holub right now on the Fearless Investor Podcast. Hey, everyone, welcome in to uh, this live on Airbnb Masterminds, or if you're watching about two or three weeks from now uh, on our YouTube channel and listening on our podcast, you're listening to the Fearless Investor Podcast. And I encourage you to go and join Airbnb Masterminds, one of the biggest Facebook groups in the world for Airbnb hosts. And today we're talking to Jacob Holub, one of my six-figure formula students who has really blown up his business in a short amount of time. We're always excited to bring in uh, anyone who's been through our program, but also just celebrate the fact that you have had success, Jacob, and you've got an amazing story. Uh, we're going to get into that story along with just the sacrifices that you've made along the way and where you're at now. But uh, before we get started, thanks for being on here, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. Um, thanks for having me. Awesome. So craziest Airbnb story. I know you've been around for just uh, a little bit of time, but I'm sure there's one or two that come to mind. Yeah. Craziest one. We had some guests, uh, you know, did the typical pre-screening was a great guest, checked all the boxes, you know, he's doctoral candidate down at U of A. Didn't think there was gonna be any issues. Woke up Sunday morning to notifications from my ring camera uh, at like, for two, between two and 4 a.m., um, police got called to the unit. Uh, there was a domestic disturbance. Uh, oh, no. Uh, obviously, you know, like most situations like that, alcohol was involved. But long story short, you know, they let some girl into the house that they probably shouldn't have, and a fight broke out. And, you know, there was drops of blood in the entryway, hair, jewelry, beads, a hole in the wall. Yikes. And, um, I had to go uh, evict them, you know, I had to skip church that morning and then go, go evict them <laughs> out. So, but you know, the, the wow. funny thing is I think people starting, they always um, have concerns about those sorts of things. Right. Yeah. It was, it was a pain in the butt to deal with on a Sunday morning, but it all worked out. Air cover covered all the damages. We got 1200 bucks from air cover and I got the guy to pay another $300 in, in fees and fines. So, yeah. I, 
I think you just nailed it on the head too. It's it, that's like the scary moment of like, what do I have to evict someone? What if I have to get rid of someone? And then when it actually happens, uh, it sucks, right? But it's not yeah. quite as crazy as you make it up to be in your head. Yeah. 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 Cool. All I right, actually man. made the guy go apologize to one of the neighbors too. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Uh, that sounds like my elementary teacher, like making me go apologize to a classmate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's funny. All right, man. Well, uh, let, let's, uh, let's rewind the clock a little bit. You live in Flagstaff, Arizona now. That's where you have, uh, seven units. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So a combination of arbitrage and co-hosts. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Um, how many arbitrage, how many co-hosts? Uh, five arbitrage, two co-hosts. Okay, awesome. So, and you started, when was this? Was it January or December? When did you start? Um, officially with the business, with our first unit was in February. Okay, so you've been on a really nice pace here at about, you know, one unit per month. Um, and But you've, you had a, a really cool story before getting into short-term rentals. So, yeah. Take people back. What did life look like before short-term rentals for you? Okay, so I guess just kind of start. I've always had a passion for real estate. I worked in real estate when I was younger. Um, brokerage, appraisals, investing, had my own investment company prior. Um, I was also prior military and did that for about six years. And I just had like this um, desire, I guess, to serve my country again. But I was like, I don't want to go in the military again. And I happened to connect with a recruiter. This was when I was living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a recruiter with the FBI. And um, I checked a lot of boxes for them. So, you know, they recruited me and I was like, hey, you know, this, this is a way I can serve my country again. I can use my, um, I did a deployment. And after my deployment, I finished my four-year degree and got my degree in real estate and finance. And, um, it's like, cool, I get to, you know, use that. I get to use, you know, this knowledge and, and, and all that. And so I was like, yeah, let's do it. So, yeah, I became a special agent in the FBI. And, um, you know, it was, it was fun. Did it for five and a half years. You know, I, I resigned now. And, you know, we'll kind of get to, to that. But, yeah, so, and that's why I was down in Puerto Rico for four and a half years. That was my first um, station and assignment. So, I mean, I know we're here to talk about short-term rentals, but everyone, yeah. I, I, I think <laughs> you probably get this question all the time, right? Like, what was it like working in the FBI? Is it is, yeah. you know, uh, Criminal Minds is the, the show that comes to mind for me, right? It's like super, yeah. super intense and like, you know, all these crime scenes that you're like trying to, to like, you know, save the world. Like that's, that's what we have in our mind. Is it that crazy or is, or is it a little bit more low key than that? Yeah. I think it's like most things, you know, Hollywood, you know, really, right. You know, kind of blows it out proportion a little bit, uh, but you, you know, it is, it, um, it depends on the violation you're working, right. There's essentially, there's two branches in the FBI. There's a criminal branch and then there's the national security branch. So um, I most, 90% of my time in the Bureau, I worked the criminal side. So I was investigating public corruption, gangs, drugs, violent crime, um, and whatnot. But uh, I will say, you know, there is a BAU in the FBI, uh, but they do not have their own private Gulfstream that they fly around in. <laughs> That's a lie. Uh, but, Funny. you know, it's, it, it's mostly desk work. It really is. It's mostly wow. desk work. A lot of, a lot of uh, report writing and just, you know, interviewing, you know, because every time you like talk to someone, you got to write up a report and, and whatnot. So I'd say for me personally, and it varies depending on, you know, like when you work gangs, you're probably out in the streets more. Um, but for me personally, I probably spent like 80% of my time at my desk. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that, that's definitely the opposite of what we think, right? Like I think yeah. of gun in the holster out in the field, you know, saving yeah. lives, but it, it, you know, the desk work, I guess, is just as important, right? Because you guys got a lot of stuff you got yeah. to do to track people down. Well, right. And, you know, and the ultimate goal is to take these things, you know, and to prosecute them. So you got to have all your ducks in a row and, yeah. you know, have all the, everything to give to the U.S. attorney's office to be able to do that. So, 
I thought the same thing when I got in. I remember when I got to my first spot, I was like, where's my black SUV? You know, like, <laughs> uh, I ended up with a, uh, it was like a maroon Ford Taurus, I think was my first uh, vehicle. Oh my it was beat to crap. And, uh, but yeah, it's so. What, uh, what about the men in black uh, Ray-Bans? You at least get those? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I had to buy those on my own. Oh, bummer. Uh, but, you know, the whole running and gunning thing type, you know, that's yeah, kinda, yeah I thought it would be more like that. But there, there are things you can do uh, in the Bureau to get that sort of experience. And so I did join the uh, SWAT team. So I was also an FBI SWAT agent. And um, that was probably the funnest part, you know, doing that stuff. But it was rewarding, you know, to take down some corrupt politicians and drug traffickers and Wow. Like that, so. so, yeah. So, I mean, like what was, first of all, what, what was maybe the most exciting part about doing those kinds of things? I could see your face light up a little bit when you said taking down, you know, like corrupt politics, <laughs> taking down drug dealers. Like, was that what it was for you? Is that where you got the excitement and the fulfillment from was taking down the bad guys? Yeah. Um, I think that for me, it was the most satisfying part. Um, but also sometimes is the most frustrating part because mm. um, if you can't build a strong enough case or for, for whatever reason, one reason or another, the U S attorney's office, you know, can't prosecute it, you know? So sometimes you, you work cases and you just can't get enough or the right things and they can't go to trial. But, so that was, so I say, you know, the whole prosecuting, taking on you know, a bad guy, it was the most rewarding, but it sometimes it's also the most frustrating thing. Oh, yeah, 100%. I'm watching uh, Catching Killers with uh, with Gracie right now. If you haven't watched that documentary, like every single one of these documentaries, they're like, we got the guy and then we didn't have enough. And then we found him like five years later and got that one thing that finally prosecuted. Yeah. And meanwhile, he got, went and killed a bunch of other people. Like, uh. I can only imagine how frustrating that is to, to be there. So, I mean, you know, I, when we, and this is like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like you go through some serious stuff with this. I bet this makes like bad guests or like annoying <laughs> guests a lot less <laughs> of an issue when you put these things into perspective. Like, hey, I went I went through some real stuff when I was with the FBI. Yeah, yeah. I, FBI, military. Yeah, I've, I've been in way more uh, stressful situations. That's for sure. That's That's crazy, man. So what were some of the the big things that you learned either with the FBI and the military that you feel like have helped you to be, you know, um, a successful entrepreneur so far in your young journey thus far? Um, well, I think kind of what we were just talking about, the biggest thing is just, you know, uh, realizing that there is going to be stress, um, preparing for it, and just, just know that's going to come. So then when it does come, you can just, you know, tackle it head on, know that it, it's not going to be the end of the world. You, you can get through it. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest, I'm a person that does get very overwhelmed and thank God for my wife. She, uh, she's, she's more of the one that kind of keeps us in the business, like on track and like, Hey, don't worry about it. Like we'll, we'll do this, this, and this. And then, you know, once I have a game plan, I'm like, all right, cool, let's do it. So. Cool. And, and so how big of a, of a role has your wife played in this business? Oh, huge, huge nice. role. Um, I think starting off, uh, not even myself realized how big of a role she was going to have. Um, so for her, so, um, you know, we were blessed that, you know, the FBI provided a uh, nice enough um, uh, living that, you know, she was able to stay home. So when we lived in Puerto Rico, she was home with our girls and then, you know, we had another child over down there. And so she's been able to stay home with her. But she's the type of person that she wants to work. Like she's she's a go-getter. She's someone that you can always depend on. She gets things done. And so um, as the business was going and we we're building, she's like, oh, I can do that. And, you know, she started doing that. She, she's our main cleaner right now. Like, wow. and she's our best cleaner. Like, I wish I could find five of her. Like she, I mean, she's just, she's awesome. And she's very good with coordinating everything with all our uh, other cleaners, you know, 
making sure things are getting assigned and we're so so anyway she, she's played a huge role she so she mainly handles um yeah uh, the the cleanings making sure either she's doing it or it's getting assigned and so on first we try to assign it and then if we can't find right. someone then she'll do it that's kind of where we're at right now and then she's also um kind of taking the lead on um um, the setups. So cool. making sure we're getting all the consumables and she'll go through the properties, see what we need. And so, so That's she's awesome. been huge, huge That's help. awesome. Cool. Well, I, I feel like we could go down that road of, of working with your, your wife, but I, <laughs> I do want to go back really quickly to uh, <laughs> this idea of transitioning from FBI agent to short-term rental operator. Uh, you took a huge leap of faith, uh, Burn the bridges. I think you had signed your first or second arbitrage deal and said, Hey, I'm going all in on short-term rentals. And despite what probably a lot of people were telling you, you you quit and, yeah. and you went all in. What was what sparked your desire? Cause I mean, I, I know when I first started working with you, like it wasn't, hey, should I quit? You were like, no, I'm quitting. Like it was yeah. a strong decision and you were confident. So where did that confidence come from to burn those bridges? Oh man, there was a few things. Um, so I should say like burn I, the boat, by the way, not burn the bridges. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. It was, yeah, it was burn the boats, right? Uh, and sometimes I'm just gonna throw this out there. Sometimes you just gotta do that. Yeah, like just, just burn the boats and just trust that it's gonna be okay, right? Like, and if it's not, oh well. Find some trees, cut them down, and build another boat if you have to. <laughs> so, but anyway, so um, like I said, I've always had a passion for real estate. I've always known that I wanted to own real estate, be involved in real estate somehow. So I knew once we came back stateside, I was going to get involved in real estate again. When, when we left, when we moved to Puerto Rico, we sold everything we had in Minnesota because um, I didn't want to deal with it at that time. Um, and so it's interesting, we got transferred to Flagstaff. That's how we ended up in Flagstaff. When okay. we moved here, it was a really tough housing market. We couldn't find anything. We finally found something, but we weren't going to be able to close for three months. So we had to live in Airbnbs for that three months. And so that, I think, is what really, at first, opened my eyes to short-term rentals. Uh, a, we were having a heck of a time trying to find something. Mm. Like everything was booked. And B, there was one unit we stayed in. It was the two bedroom portion we lived in. And then they had a studio attached to it. We lived in there for about a month. And, and then I just was noticing that studio was just constantly full. Like it was just, there was always somebody in there. Mm. This is crazy. Like how, like it just, and so I guess that's when I started looking into it. So that was spring. 2021 okay fast forward fall 2021 we decided that hey let's buy uh, buy something and make it a short-term rental around that same time uh is when i got connected with anthony faso yeah you were on you were on his podcast yeah i had listened to that i was actually talking with him and i was telling him about our plans and he's like hey you need to check out this guy kyle he knows a way that you can do short-term rentals without owning the property. You know, I, um, I'm like, really? Okay. I'm like, so I looked into it. I, and then I started following you and your stuff and then bought your uh, uh, quick start course. I think it was in November, you were doing a Thanksgiving sale. And <laughs> that's how I got connected with you. There and you then go. we were like, well, instead of putting this pile of cash into buying one property, yeah, let's let's do this arbitrage thing, and we can have four or five, six properties, and it's probably going to generate more cash flow than just one property would. So that was kind of my thought process with it, and so um, well, and, and then I, around I that same time, I think it's important to know too. I mean, your goal at the time was was cash flow i mean it, did you did you know at that time that you were trying to create something that was going to help you leave the fbi or or was that yeah, not, yeah okay so and, and i think that's important i and i want to pause here just for a second as yeah, just yeah. a moment for people to understand like everyone's always asking what's better is it ownership is it coasting is it arbitrage 
it's all dependent on what you're trying to do. And Jacob here is trying to leave a job. He's got a pile of cash and he knows that if he puts that pile of cash into one house, he might create a thousand to two thousand dollars of cash flow and a ton of equity, which could lead to, to wealth. But that's not what he's trying to build at that moment. Wealth is down the road. Whereas if he took that same pile of cash and he put it towards four or five, six arbitrage deals instead of one purchase, he could now 4x or 5x that cash flow, which could help him leave a current situation. And now, now where he's at, now he's able to say, okay, now I'm building a business where I could eventually start buying more homes to eventually lead to more cash flow. So I think that's an important part for people to understand. But I I, I want to get back to to where you were at. So you yeah. you got you you got connected with me, you got that the course. Um, and were you at this point, like, all right, as soon as I get my first one, I'm quitting or like, what, what was the next step? Yeah. So during that, that fall, I was going through a season at my, uh, job as a special agent where it was just kind of like, um, you know, I think maybe this wasn't the right fit. It just, Hmm. I won't go into a lot of details. There, There was just a lot of different things going on where I was like, yeah, this, this is not where I see myself for the next 15 years until retirement. And so my wife and I started having that conversation. And, and then, like I was saying, at the same time as when we came, uh, we we're talking with um, Anthony and you, and we started making a plan. It was like, all right, well, let's, let's start doing this and um, we'll build it up on the side. And, you know, and then we'll think about, you know, me resigning in about two years. And then it was, uh, you know, we just progressed and, and then um, things just started going good. It's like, all right, well, you know, you could probably resign in a year. And then it was, I think, so I signed my first one in February mm-hmm. and then we signed another one in March and then another one at the end of March. And um, but I, had, I was already talking with those people, but, uh, but basically it's like, all right, well, maybe this summer. And then it was like, this is going good. How soon can you quit? <laughs> so, and, and you're and asking so that to yourself. Well, the, my wife and I, and like conversations, oh, okay, were okay. And like, 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 wow, this, you know, this, this is working. Like, this is, yeah, you know, we can scale this quickly, and you know, how how soon can you quit so that you can just really focus on this full time? And so. Yeah, there there was a date for you know reasons I won't go into. I had to stay in until a certain date, mm-hmm. but once that date hit, I you know I gave them you know like a pretty good notice. It was like two months. Yeah, but uh, I said when this date hits, I'm you know I have no more obligations, uh, and so I'm going to be resigning, and um, and then we just hit the ground running. Did a bunch of arbitrages. Um, co-host was slow because. I think it was just more me, just not, uh, what I say, like being able to sell myself and what I know, right? And, and that I know what I'm doing. But once I had those arbitrages under my belt, I mean, like, look, average market is 70%. We've been at 80%. Average yeah. rates is this. We've been at this. I know what I'm doing. And now the co host leads are just flowing in like crazy. Yeah, you collected that data. That's good. Um, yeah, that's something we can get into too. But I want to ask you when you when you gave your notice and you had, you know, it sounded like you had one, maybe you're about to sign your second. What what were what were the the thoughts in your mind? Were they like, yeah, I got this? Were they like, holy crap, what am I doing? <laughs> it was a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. It was. And so I guess um really to boil it down to what gave us the confidence is uh honestly working with Anthony Faso. And setting up the our uh, infinite banking um, mm-hmm. system, because um, then I knew like, you know, if this completely flops and I screw up, at least we still have some sort of nest egg sitting over here to bail us out if we need to. And uh, so that gave us confidence. Uh, it was your course, um, you know, following the course. It, it, pretty much gave us everything we needed to be successful. And so that gave me the confidence in that I, I know what I need to do. It's right here, right? So I do this and talking with the owners and 
it, it did help that I had a real estate background and, um, and whatnot. And so there was that. And then the other thing was, is I know whenever I get crazy ideas, my wife tells me I'm crazy, but uh, she was like on board with this from the beginning, like with me resigning, with doing this business. And wow. she didn't have any sort of reservation. So, you know, it's, uh, we, we just felt like it was God telling us that we were going down the right path. Yeah. Well, and that's so huge too, right? Because you got kids at home. It's not just her that you're her and yourself yeah. that fighting for it's you know you got a whole family there and uh that that had to be super reassuring because i i know you're a man of faith and you know praying about it and having the support you mentioned from our course from anthony and and but now the biggest person you need support from is your wife um yeah. was was that all you needed to know that you were going down the right path or like how big of a relief was that knowing that she was on board Oh, it, it was huge. Yeah. Like I just, I, I never had the feeling of like, we were definitely doing the right thing and making the right decision yeah. as I did in, in that moment and making this decision. So it, it was huge. Yeah. Yeah. She, so, she's, she's way more, uh, I guess, uh, I would say like reserved and conservative than I am. I'm, I'm like the, big picture guy, like, let's take risk. And yeah, and she's more of a, no, let's, you know, we, we balance each other in that way. And sometimes it causes arguments, but uh, you know, it, it's a good, it's a good thing to have, I think. And so, yeah, for her to be like, yeah, let's do this. I, uh, it was huge. I think that's good too. I, anytime I work with couples, I think it's always, uh, I, and I don't know what it is about couples, but a lot, a lot of couples do attract, like there's the, the visionary and then there's the person who's like, wait, let's slow down and get things taken care of. And it's a nice balance to be able to say like, you know, Hey, even though I want to go hundred miles an hour, I do need to have some of these little things set up, uh, to make sure that we can go hundred miles an hour. So, um, has that been a nice, um, added, you know, balance to help you just make sure that your business is on a good path? Yeah, she's, uh, she's saved our butts quite a few times. Nice. I, I've quite a few times uh, in the last six months, I've probably bitten off more than we could chew um, or haven't had things in place quite yet, but uh, we've got it done. You know, we got it done. And uh, a big part of that is because of her. So, yeah. and, and now she's like my voice of reason. I'm starting to learn, you know, like this is really the first time we've had our own business. We we had our real estate thing back in Minnesota before, but it wasn't really a business. It was more just an entity that we were doing things through. But um, so I, I'm learning like she's uh, she's wise counsel. I go. need to listen to her when she hey. speaks. And I don't <laughs> always, I don't, I'll admit that, but I'm learning, so. You, you mean you're actually admitting that your wife is right most of the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> uh, happy wife, happy yeah. wife. Um, yeah. All right. So I got, a, I got a question for everyone else and I got a question for you. But guys, if, yeah. if you're listening right now, I'm sure you've got to have some sort of, it, there's, there's someone out there right now that's listening that's like, I need to burn the boats. I need to jump in. I need to do this, but I'm scared to death. Post right now in the comments what your situation is. I want, I want to hear about what that looks like and what's the biggest fear that's holding you back from just going all in to help you get to your dreams. And, and with that being said, for you, Jacob, what I want to ask is when you actually did make that decision and it was your last day in the FBI and then you were able to give your full attention to your business what happened after that um it, yeah i think just being being intentional and just um you know put the work in every day it just compounded right mm -hmm. so those first three arbitrages it wasn't um i guess a mistake the ones that the landlords I ended up working with it was kind of um, a, a, a uh, what I would say like a, a decision that I made because of 
who they were. And so, for example, like the very first lady I did my arbitrage with, she owns multiple units in town. So I was like, I want to put in a lot of effort into making this deal work, right? Because if I can prove to her and I can make her happy, mm -hmm. then I'm, I'm lined up to be able to get more units from her, which is exactly what happened. That's awesome. Three of our five arbitrages are with her. Nice. Um, and then another one was a property manager. Uh, I had a heck of a time kind of even getting in the door with property managers, right? Like, cause being in a highly, um, a big vacation town, a lot yeah. of property managers do short-term rental suit. They think they do, but you know what I mean? And, right. um, so when I found a property manager who, um, was willing to listen to me and she had no interest in doing short-term rentals and she manages, <clears throat> I think just under a hundred properties in town and, you know, she's connected. So I put a lot into that relationship because I knew, you know, you, you reap what you sow, right. And I wanted to sow into that. So it, it freed me up to really just kind of focus and, and put my attention um, into things that I knew that were going to pay off down the road. And then um, just learning, learning more, keep going through the courses, the videos, and just fine tuning things, perfecting things, making sure, you know, getting systems and processes in place and just, and then being able to spend more time on uh, education from other sources and, you know, about short term rentals. So, yeah. So it, it sounds to me like what, what you really were able to have was more time to pour into some of these relationships that would help you to get where you're at today with those seven units. Is that a good Exactly. Way to yeah. 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 So, and, and by the way, um, we just had a comment here from Nikita. I want to share this, uh, I'm nervous about scaling. The rent keeps adding up. I also think I, uh, went about furnishing the wrong way because I'm still, paying it off, credit back from furniture on previous units. Uh, Emily just posted here, husband and I both work a ridiculous amount of hours at, uh, at our W-2 jobs. We have two-year-old son. We're trying to uh, make and create memories with. We own and manage an SCR. Um, I, I feel like one of us will need to quit our full-time job in order to get started but then we're putting our assets at risk. I mean, I, I'm sure some of these things that, that you're hearing from these comments are probably stuff not only that you were worried about, but still dealing with today. Am I, am I right on that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. Yeah, I mean, what would you say to someone right now, like Emily or Nikita, who are just like, hey, I'm, I'm worried about scaling. I'm worried about leaving the W-2 job. I'm worried about those kinds of things. Um, being in the position that you're in, where what would you say to someone like that? So what I would say, and I think what's kind of really made us successful is you, if you're if you're in Kyle's course, you have the tools you need, right? You you know the roadmap, you know what's going to get it done. It works, um, and then just being um, really good about doing analysis is a. Uh, couple of our first arbitrage, I realized I needed to do a little deeper analysis, like with the cleaning fee and, and stuff like that. And so now I've got that figured out. So our, uh, our spread wasn't as nice as I thought it was going to be, but we're still making money. Um, so, you know, get, getting good at analysis and making sure you know your market and just don't use generalities. I mean, generalities can be good just to do a quick analysis, but, you know, spend time getting to know your market and understanding um, the numbers. Um, and then I was going to say, yeah, being, being a good steward, right? So I think what's really helped us is like we treat all our properties like they're our own property. Yeah. Um, you know, if I show up and there's something wrong with the property, like, like one time uh, I noticed there's a branch that was rubbing on the roof and I was like, hey, I noticed this, you know, it's going to potentially cause you issues down the road. Are you okay if I take care of it? And it was like, oh, thank you so much for letting us know. Yeah, have someone take care of it and then send us the bill. I'm like, all right, cool. So, you know, just, and the, the lady I told you we have three with, like, 
one time uh, bathroom faucet went bad and I just fixed it and you know it wasn't it wasn't our fault it wasn't the guest's fault it was an old an old gasket that went bad and just needed to be fixed and she's like oh tell me how much I owe you oh, don't worry about it. you know it was 25 bucks and then like two hours of my time so but just being a good steward right and yeah. just taking care of the properties and I think if you do that that's going to help with your relationships and I think that's what's really set us apart and now people are like you need to talk to Diego he's, he's um, great he takes great care of properties like you know so I say if you worry about scale, um, scaling and I think she mentioned rents too I know rents are tight here as well but then there's, there's other things you can offer maybe to try to get the rent lower or yeah. better terms or something like that. Like, so for example, one of our properties um, had a renter in there for six years and it was really well lived in. And there's just things that needed, you know, light fixtures that were broken. All the faucets had calcium buildup on them. Mm -hmm. and, and they're like, yeah, we'll rent it to you. I'm like, well, I'll, I'll pay you what you're asking, but you need to do this, this, and this. Like, fix this, fix this. Well, we, we don't have the money or they weren't willing to. I forget which one it was to put in the property. I'm like, well, I'll make you a deal. I'll take care of all that stuff. And you're going to give me one month of free rent. And you're going to give me reduced rent for the first six months. And then we'll bump it up the next six months. and then. I'll bump it up another 5% for the second year. So I got a two-year lease out of it. That's good. And I know some people say like, well, why would you put your money into the property? Uh, even if you're getting one month free, just go find something else. Well, I mean, things are tight here. Yeah. So if you get someone who's interested in working with you and doing arbitrage, figure out a way to make it work. What's a, what's a problem the landlord has that you can mm. solve for them? Yeah. Uh, there, there's so much good stuff there. And that really comes down to kind of what we wanted to talk about today, right? How to get more deals by being the owner's superhero. Uh, what I heard there is you were a superhero in a couple of different ways. You were able to, uh, you know, help them get their, their tenants that were leaving after six years that had really lived in it, as you said, uh, fix some of those issues without them having to do it. You, you notice a couple of things about another property that maybe the other owner wasn't even aware of. And you came in almost like a really good property manager, one that is giving mm -hmm. their full attention to the property to make it as good as possible. And to me, there's no, no, there's no wonder why people wouldn't be screaming your name at that point and trying to get you more deals because you're helping them out. Um, one, one story that comes to mind for me is, and Nikita, I think this is a good point for you is, if you can do exactly what Jacob just said and find the pain points of the, those owners, right? I found an owner one time, actually, uh, Gracie, my wife found the owner. We went in together after she had had one discussion with the owner and, you know, this owner ran out of money while renovating. And he's like, Hey, I, I couldn't get new cabinets because I, you know, I ran out of money. I did all of my, my stuff on the floor, um, spent $20,000 on floor and paint. And I said, well, what if we painted the cabinets for you? And he, oh my gosh, that would be amazing. That's like $2,500. I just couldn't afford it. Great. You know, if we do that for you, which by the way, in my mind, I knew because I had really good handymen, it was only going to cost me $1,500 or like Jacob, if you want to go do it on your own and you're just putting in time instead of money, now I can create some value for this owner that will give me the opportunity to say, hey, if I do this though, I'm providing value, I need a lower rent. I need a month for free. I need two months for free. Those are the kind of things you can now start to do if you can find those pain points. Um, Jacob, is there another story like that that you've had so far um, you know, with any other owners that, that you feel like um, has been able to help them win when they usually um, would have had to settle for less? Um, trying to think. Oh, I, well, our last arbitrage that we just got on right now, actually. So the lady we have three with, she had a um, a unit come available. It's in a duplex type building, so it's upper unit and lower unit. And it was a lower unit, and um, it hadn't had any res um, renovations or updates in probably over ten years and. Um, you know, tenants 
you know, trash in the place where so right. she's like, uh, you know, would you be interested in this? And so I went and looked at it and I was like, well, this is what would need to be done. Um, she's like, well, if I do that, what would you be willing to pay me in rent? And, you know, we figured out a fair value, like a, an amount of money that she was happy with by investing her money to improve the property and the rent that the numbers, you know, made sense for us. And then I became like her quasi project manager. And I actually got to have a say in some of the re um, renovations that were being done. And nice. And when it got finished, she's like, oh my gosh, like, this is my best looking unit. Like, mm. I, I, I would have never had the vision to do what you did. And, you know, and, and so she's just extremely happy. So that's so cool. Well, and, and you can tell if you're not listening intently right now, I can at least tell that Jacob, you, you care and you put, you're a man of your word. You really, if you tell them you're going to do something, you do it. And I think that's just part of being good at business and, and good in this industry as well. Um, so kudos to you for doing that, man. There is one story that you told Thanks. me along the way. Yeah. There's one story you told me along the way that I think people need to hear. You had a guy that you reached out to via email and he said, I'm not interested in, in short term oh. rentals. Right. But then you said, well, yeah. let, let me at least, you know, come and meet you. Uh, can you, can you share that story? This, but, and by the way, I'm, I'm asking this question because I can't tell you how many people, um, uh, just accept the word no without, you know, just giving that one extra last push or that one extra, Hey, I, I care about, you know, your, your property or who you are. And, and you did that. And, and I want people to hear this story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I remember that one. Yeah. Um, so I guess, first of all, about getting notes, I remember early on when I was in real estate, I was a salesperson and, you know, someone told me like, Oh, keep going until you get five notes. Right. And so they didn't really explain it to me or coach me or teach me like what they really meant by that. Right. And so like, I just, I would always get nose and door slam my face. I'm like, well, I got my five nose. All right, move on. Now I understand it's not just get your five nose. It's why are they saying no? Mm. And then trying to talk about it and bring it out of them. And then maybe they'll still say no. And you just kind of keep working on what is it? What's their hang up, right? So, so yeah, this guy, I emailed them um, and I never mentioned short-term rentals, you know, just, it was like my standard, hey, be interested in renting your place. When can I come look at it? And then I think he might've saw like my website or it's probably my, or he looked up my email or something and realized I was a short-term rental company. And so one day he just emailed me, he's like, He's like, are you planning on living in this or like, what are you doing? Like, it's, I don't, I don't want a short-term rental or I don't want to do short-term rentals or something like that. I don't remember. And then, yeah, I just responded and I was like, I was like, no, I, I'm not planning on living in it. I, I am planning on being your tenant and I'd love to talk with it, uh, talk with you more about it in person and explain it. And um and then, so yeah, I met with him and then we just, we just hit it off. You know, I developed that rapport, you know, um, found out like we had a lot of common ground. He had a beard. I had a beard, you know, <laughs> you like country music. I like country music. He had family from the upper Midwest. So that's where I'm from. Nice. Um, you know, we just, we just hit it off. And this, this was actually his house. Mm. Uh, that he lived in and him and his wife built a new house and this is the first time they're going to be renting it out so I was like well you really want to risk putting a long-term person in here and like they end up trashing the place or you know have someone like me who's going to be checking on your property constantly and you, you know and just kind of you know we're going to keep your property pristine because we have to because yeah. if we don't it's going to affect our business so so yeah, it was just, I just went in there and uh, just built really good rapport with him. And now I'd say, you know, we're, we're buddies, you know, it's more than just a landlord tenant relationship. And uh, so I, I pitched him the co-host and the arbitrage thing. And, 
you know, he wanted to go arbitrage it. So this guy, he's actually a, a real estate salesperson in town. Nice. And they have a person in their office that does short-term rental management. And he still decided to let me rent it from him and, and, and do this. That's, that's so good. I, the term that comes to mind for me is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think mm -hmm. most people yeah. would have, when, when they got that email that you said, hey, you know, are you looking at short-term rental this or are you going to live here yourself? Because I'm not interested in renting it out to anyone that's not going to live here. Instead of you going into pitching mode and showing how much you can offer as a service and how much you can help and how much you can, you know, do this, this, and this, you went into, let's just meet. Let's just see if you even like me as a person. And you guys were able to connect. You were able to share some, some commonalities. And this guy eventually just said, I think I want to do business with this person because he could tell that you're, you're a man of your word. And so to me, you took that extra time to go show them, you know, like, this is who I am as a person. This is the person you're going to do business with. Oh, by the way, here's all the benefits of short-term rentals as well. And, yeah. and I think that's why you got that deal. And I think that's also why you're getting a lot more deals. And like you mentioned, in a tough place to get deals. And so um, last question here, and, and it's mainly just to help Nikita here. She said, hey, I've got yeah. six units. I want to get to 10 by the end of the year, but the furniture cost is so big. Um, I know a lot of our students have started with arbitrage and then kind of moved over to the co-hosting model for this exact same reason. It feels like you're kind of doing the same thing, uh, but what what could you say in regards to you know the upfront costs and how to get past that? Um, my wife is amazing at finding deals, <laughs> so um, I think uh, just the nature of this town. There's a lot of people coming and going. You know, we have a, a big university here. It's a D1 university, so you get college kids moving and coming and going all the time. Um, but we've just been able to find a lot of good deals, like on Facebook Marketplace, and um, yeah, pretty much Facebook Marketplace. And then she she's good about watching Target, and anytime anything she knows that we're going to need comes on sale, she'll just buy it, like we'll stock up on. Our, our guest room has turned into storage of uh, <laughs> towels and pots and pans and pillows and sheets. And um, just because every time Target has a sale, she'll buy as much as she can just Fine. to get that 20% off. Right? Yeah. So just, just um, that's the biggest thing I think that has helped us is, is hunt for those deals. This last arbitrage we did, it's a two bedroom, one bath. 700 square feet i think and i think our all-in costs are going to be under six grand nice that's amazing yeah. that's really amazing um she says she appreciates that info so thank you uh but yeah nikita just to add to that you know the coasting model that's why i went the coasting route after doing some arbitrages because there's zero dollars to invest mm -hmm. and you can still cash flow upwards of a thousand dollars per property um that's how we scale our business but along with uh, Jacob said, not only looking for deals, but also working that into your numbers, right? If I'm going to get a 0% interest credit card for the, the purpose of furniture, or if I'm going to go get that bulk order on Amazon so I can get that 0% interest for 12 or 18 months, I got to work that into the deal to make sure I'm paying off that credit card or that order while also cash flowing at the same time. So um, just knowing your numbers. Uh, I will say so. So we haven't done that too much because we had we had a pretty big pile of cash, and you know we're using the infinite bank concept. We won't get all that, and so we're that's how we're financing it. Yeah. But I will say that is also why every time I do uh, an arbitrage, I try to get at least two years, if not more, because then I know, yeah, you know, first six months or a year is going to be just recouping my costs, and then after that, it's just all profit yeah very good man okay well this has been a ton of value i really appreciate you jumping on here sharing your story um sounds like we've got some some people out there listening that are, are getting some great value from it so i appreciate you jacob uh where can good. people uh continue to follow your journey uh social media website what, what would you like to share 
Yeah, um, you can find us. Our, our website is AZ, as in Arizona, STR, as in short-term rental, hospitality.com. So as all, no spaces or underscores, just AZ, STR, hospitality is our website. You can get in touch with me on there. My Calendly, Calendly link is on there too, if you want to try to schedule a meeting with me and talk about something specific. Um, I am on Instagram. Um, I haven't started a, a business page yet, but I plan on to, but you can find me on there. Uh, uh, Paco, P-A-C-O, Holub, H-O-L-U-B. Um, funny story about that. I got that because of the FBI. Because <laughs> so, uh, quick, Is there time for a quick funny story? Yeah, yeah go for it. Okay, so down, living down in Puerto Rico, I'm with one of my colleagues and we're in a coffee shop and I know her real name. They ask for her name and she gives them a different name. We'll just say Maria. And I'm like, oh, is that your middle name? Or do you like to go by Maria? Like, cause I've been calling you this this whole time. And she's like, no, no, no. That's just the name I use when I order stuff. So when they call out my name, they're not using my real name. I was like, oh, it's like, I should probably do that. That same time though, I had already given them my name, Jacob, but being in a Spanish speaking place, I don't know if they misheard me or they just decided to kind of like change it. They, when my order came up, they called me Paco. <laughs> Paco. And so I'm like, that's my new that's, ordering name. So that's your alias. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I ended up with Paco. I started Instagram when I was down there. So I just called it Paco. So All right, like, Paco. You know, that's, that's what yeah. I'm calling you from now on too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go follow Paco, Paco Holub. <laughs> Jacob, thanks yeah. so much, man. Thanks for jumping on. Uh, so, so proud of what you've been able to accomplish in a short amount of time. I know we're just starting. I know they're going to be, you're going to be in a completely different position in your life and in your business. And even just a year from now. Um, and I know there's some great things ahead for you, but thank you for jumping on here and helping our audience to conquer the world of short term yeah. rentals. Show notes for this one are fearlesskyle.com forward slash Paco. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> slash Jacob Holub. That's Jacob, like you would usually spell it. Holub is H O L U B as in boy. And you can go get connected with him. You can see all of this that you just watched again. Um, and if you really just, again, want to get on that same path as Jacob, all you have to do is email us info at fearlesskyle.com with the title 6FF, and we will get you more information so that you can start learning how you can get into our accelerated program, our mastermind, our course that allows you to be able to build this six-figure business in under 12 months. And one of the things that I love about Jacob is that he really is a man of his word. He focuses on building relationships built off of trust and following through and doing the things that he said he's going to do, but more, you know, he, he undersells and over delivers. He goes in there and he, he gets these, the, the trust of the landlords first, just by the conversation and connecting with them. And then through the follow through and actually painting the house and fixing that branch across, uh, you know, that's, that's brushing across the, the house and actually, you know, doing the things that he said that he's going to do plus more. And if you can do that, I'm telling you, that's where the leads start to come in. That's where a, a true business is built off of that strong foundation of relationships. So go do it. And we cannot wait for the next episode to help you to go and conquer the world of Airbnb and short-term rentals. We'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.